Good morning, everyone. It's Russ. I'm back again to brighten up your day. It's getting to be summertime here around Richmond, so I thought I'd drag out the tie-dye t-shirt again. And by the way, yes, that's Johnny in the background. He's hoping to try out as a lounge singer near a nearby pub. We'll see how it goes. I'm not betting on it, though. Let's start with your dad jokes before we get to our five research articles today. These come to us once again from the website countryliving.com. And once more, we're going to go to the dark dad jokes category. So here's a few for you. The guy who stole my diary went missing. My thoughts are with his family. <laughs> you got to think about that, right? I did anyway. What did the cow say to the leather chair? Hi, mom. <laughs> I'd love to have kids one day, but that's about as long as I think I can handle them. And finally, hard work pays off later. Laziness pays off now. Boy, I can think about that one for, for a while as well. All right, guys, thanks so much for the uh, putting up with the dad jokes. Let's get started with our research update. Now, this week there was a review, or excuse me, a large study conducted in Denmark on the long-term effects of ADHD on social and health outcomes. What the study found is not all that different from what we had already seen in the literature looking at clinical populations. For instance, my longitudinal study out in Wisconsin that followed kids up for about 20 plus years into young adulthood found very similar results. I think what makes this unique, however, is that it's an entire population study. So the results can be considered much more robust than focusing strictly on clinic referred populations. So this study used the entire population registry of Denmark and looked at individuals who were at least 30 years old or to some extent uh, younger, but then turned 30 during the period of 2005 to 2016. And they're looking at a 10 year observation period of these young adults. And what they found was that the patients with ADHD had experienced substantially more socioeconomic difficulties as uh, indexed by direct health care costs, as well as higher rates of psychiatric comorbidity and greater use of multiple medications known as co-medication compared to the control group. They did not find an association between adhering to ADHD medication and the amount of education that was completed. Uh, that doesn't surprise me either because it's difficult to examine that relationship in a population like this with all these different educational outcomes. That's simply to say that it doesn't mean that medication didn't help with educational completion but uh, it did not play that significant a role here. They did, however, find that adherence to medication was negatively linked to employment status by age 30. Now, that may not make sense to you. You would think that if you adhere to medication, you'd be doing better in employment status. But wait, we've talked about this before. The more likely you are to be on medication, the worse your disorder is likely to have been. And this study found that also the more comorbidity you had. So it really is the baseline level of severity and amount of comorbidity that is predicting both medication adherence and the negative effects on employment status. Overall, it's yet another study that points out the seriousness of ADHD by adulthood with regard to various educational, health, and employment outcomes. All right, next up is a study that was published over in BMC Pregnancy and Childbirth. This one comes to us out of Canada, and it's looking at a very large population sample and examining the type of delivery, that is the mode of obstetric delivery, and the risk of ADHD in those children. So this is called the Quebec Pregnancy cohort. And they're looking at, let's scan down here, they've got over 31,000 cases of ADHD in this database uh, and an even larger population of controls, over 229,000 uh, individuals. So what did they find? They found that 
Uh, the vast majority of children were delivered vaginally without assistance. So about 73%. They had about a 6% rate of deliveries that were vaginally assisted deliveries, as they call them. And about 3% were delivered through elective cesarean section. However, 19% had an emergency cesarean section. Now, let's take a look at those different modes of delivery and did they predict ADHD in those offspring? They found that using unassisted vaginal delivery as the control point, that is the reference point, they found that there was a 12% increase in ADHD when there was assisted vaginal delivery, only about a 6% increase in ADHD when there was a emergency cesarean delivery. Interestingly, they also found a slight reduction in risk for ADHD in those who had elective cesarean delivery. Not sure whether that was significant or not. It was only about a 4% risk reduction. So overall, it's looking like mode of delivery is somehow related to the risk of ADHD in the offspring. Now, this could have to do with the delivery complications that could be affecting brain functioning and therefore creating risk for ADHD. On the other hand, this study did not control for the genetic risk of ADHD in the mother and ADHD risk in offspring. And we've talked about that repeatedly. When studies don't examine that, it's kind of difficult to interpret their associations because it's very possible that women with ADHD are more likely to have pregnancy and birth complications, but they're also more likely to have ADHD kids too. And the pregnancy and birth complications aren't the cause of the ADHD in the offspring, but instead are just a marker that the mom has the disorder. So that needs to be controlled in studies like this before we can interpret their results in any straightforward way. But I thought you might want to hear about that study because it was a very large study done out of Canada. Now, our third study up this morning is on the chronotype preference. That's the time of day that individuals prefer sleep disturbances and personality or temperament in teens with ADHD. Now, this is a study out of Turkey. By the way, Turkey is doing some very interesting research on not only ADHD, but on cognitive disengagement syndrome as well. So in this study, they looked at 102 teenagers between 11 and 17, and these teenagers completed a variety of questionnaires uh, about not only their ADHD, but of course their personality and temperament, their chronotype preference, and sleep problems. And what they found, which we have seen many times before, is that adolescents with ADHD had a significantly higher rate of sleep disturbance. They also, however, had a higher prevalence of evening preference in their chronotype. About 64% in fact had a preference for the evening chronotype compared to controls. They found that the in the ADHD group, it was novelty seeking, that personality trait, as well as harm avoidance that were related to the individual's sleeping difficulties. Notably, novelty seeking was the most pronounced predictor of not only a preference for evening hours, but also sleeping difficulties. So it's an interesting study that shows that not only, once again, sleep problems are associated with ADHD in children, teens, and adults. In the study, it was teens they were looking at, but that the personality traits of the individual might also be affecting that risk. And certainly, it is influencing their preference for evening chronotype. Okay, nice study out of Turkey there. That was published over in the journal Chronobiology International. Our fourth paper this morning comes to us from the Journal of Physical Education Theory and Methodology. This is a review that was conducted by Italian professionals, and it's a review of the literature on the effects of martial arts on ADHD. 
both cognitive and behavioral effects. And although the title says they are examining epigenetic effects, they didn't really. They simply are theorizing about some epigenetic influences, but they didn't really examine that as they point out. I'm going to scroll down here and show you that it was a narrative review of the studies that were available to them. Uh, a narrative review simply means they go through it study by study by study, and they look to see whether there's consistency across the studies. This is not a meta-analysis where the reviewer actually gets the data from all of the studies and combines them into a more robust analysis of the findings. So this is not a meta-analysis, just a review of the studies. There were 11 such peer-reviewed studies they located, looking at various martial arts practices such as Taekwondo, Judo, Karate, and so on. And the authors believe that the research indicates that martial arts interventions were associated with improvements, not only in ADHD symptoms, but specifically in attention, working memory, and inhibitory control. And they believe that this was even greater in the more structured martial arts disciplines of Judo and Taekwondo than in the less structured ones. Uh, they did report that some studies found additional benefits in emotion regulation and so on, but those were not consistently found. There's only one drawback to a review like this and studies like this. What was the control group? If it was a waitlist control group and they got benefits from the martial arts, it's not clear that it was specifically the martial arts. It could just be physical activity and exercise. You know from prior reviews on this channel that physical exercise of any type is beneficial to improving and coping with ADHD symptoms. So we need control groups in which the individuals are experiencing just general physical activity, we can then compare that to martial arts to see whether there's something special about martial arts that's even more effective than exercise. But this review didn't do that, so that would be one qualifier with regard to interpreting its results. Okay, our last study for this morning comes to us from the journal Scientific Reports, and this is a review a meta-analysis of the association between ADHD and intestinal disorders. And the study, uh, oh, excuse me, the review was able to locate 11 studies involving more than 3.8 million individuals, including more than 175,000 with ADHD. And what they found is that the odds of having an intestinal disorder were significantly greater in those with ADHD, specifically irritable bowel syndrome increased by a risk of 63% in those with ADHD compared to those without. Also of interest is that they found a trend toward greater difficulties with intestinal disorders and specifically IBS in the Middle Eastern regions as compared to Europe, the Americas, and even the Western Pacific, where the risk actually was lower slightly in those with ADHD. So it looks like there's some international or country of origin effects here that might need more clarification. Nevertheless, overall, across all the studies, ADHD is linked to intestinal difficulties, especially IBS. The authors believe this may have to do with the fact that ADHD in its genetics may have an altering effect on the gut microbiome that increases the likelihood of these intestinal difficulties. So interesting idea there. All right, that's it for this morning. I hope you found this to be informative and useful. Uh, and of course, I always like to bring up the dad jokes to provide a little entertainment, obviously, at my expense. So thanks again for joining me this morning. And as always, I conclude with my salutation to live well, be well, take care, and bye for now.